You're looking at rare color footage of Berlin, Germany in 1900, depicting one of the world's great cities of its time. The new 20th century Germany was fast emerging with new advancements, discoveries, and inventions in communications, increased family travel, and a higher quality of everyday German family life, spawning a new middle-class society, freed much from the strict economic and social class barriers drawn from centuries before. Germany was benefiting from the highest literacy rate in Europe at 99%. These high educational levels provided the nation with more quality scientists, engineers, chemists, skilled workers and managers for its factories, knowledgeable farmers, and professional military officers. Overall, the German people were thriving. The number of births were well beyond the number of deaths. Laws regulating working hours and working conditions were passed. Compulsory insurance against death and old age was introduced. Welfare was provided for widows and orphans. Historically, past expansive social and political revolutions in the world were always preceded by catastrophic events such as famine. Europe was inexorably on a path toward another kind of catastrophic event, a world war. A worldwide conflict made exponentially more devastating by its intense industrialization and fluid access to millions of human lives. Germany's defeat in World War I and its ensuing devastating depression would bring a radical political change to Germany, the likes of which the European continent had never seen happen before to a nation state with such an advanced culture and society. Estimates are that Germany lost some 9 million soldiers and 6 million civilians in World War I. The Great War marked the beginning of this terrifying period sometimes coined as the Dark Continent. German losses were central to this wider disaster which would ensue. One needs to understand the medical, social, economic, and political dimensions of those losses. This dark world, which first emerged during World War I, now was setting the macabre stage for the rise of Hitler and Nazism. The Nazification of Germany was unquestionably the most heinous and insidiously destructive political movement the world could never have even imagined in 1900, no less have endured and survived. Hitler knew he needed a scapegoat that the German people could point to as the major cause for all their ills which contributed to their national collapse. That scapegoat was the Jews. But scapegoats are mostly used to blame the past. Now, with the advent of their racial credo, the master race, they had in the Jews the key to their future. Although total victory in World War II was front and center for the Nazis, there was no less a priority than enforcing the complete extermination of the peoples. A people who played such a vital role, contributing to virtually all aspects of the fabric of German society and culture. From 1900 through the Weimar Republic years in the 1920s, German Jewish families had to a great extent successfully both assimilated and acculturated into German society. Most of these German Jewish people felt firstly as German nationals and lived their lives amongst the general population and were by and large accepted as such. Included in the Holocaust dreadful carnage and exodus was the loss of many of Germany's greatest Jewish minds in science, medicine, and technology. Jewish intellectuals and creative professionals were among the leading figures in many areas of Weimar culture. German universities' faculties became universally open to Jewish scholars in 1918. Leading Jewish intellectuals and some university faculty included physicist Albert Einstein, 
sociologist Karl Mannheim, philosophers like Walter Benjamin, political theorists like Gustav Mayer, and many others. Nine German citizens were awarded Nobel Prizes during the Weimar Republic, five of whom were Jewish scientists, including two in medicine. But in no less a way was the astounding loss of untold numbers of the highly talented and versatile Jewish artists, writers, performers, and musicians. Musical performers like cabaret singer Dora Gerson and operetta star Liesel Frank, artists like Carlotta Solomon and Felix Nussbaum, diarists and poets like Anne Frank and Selma Mirbaum Isinger. Unfinished Lives portrays four of these talented artists who still their great works live on today in museums, music halls, universities, and libraries worldwide. They are Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, founder of the Debrucka art movement of modern expressionism, Ilse Weber, the superbly talented playwright, composer, and songstress, Erwin Schulhoff, the renowned classical and jazz composer and performer, and Selma Mirbaum Isinger, the extraordinarily gifted teenage poet. I'm in MoMA storage with Ernst Ludwig Kirchner's The Street Berlin, painted in 1913. Kirchner had moved to Berlin a couple of years earlier with other members of the expressionist painter group Der Brucke, but by 1913 many of them had, had left and he was there in the city on his own. This is one of a number of, of street scenes he painted all characterized as this work is by this vivid anti-naturalistic color, these spilling perspectives, and this very, very visible brush stroke, all hallmarks of Expressionist painting. You instantly recognize that Kirchner's subject is not the city per se. Instead, his true subject is the psychological experience of an individual in this very large, overcrowded urban metropolis. At this point, Berlin was the third largest city in the world. And Kirchner clearly is, is responding to that in the way that he structures this composition. The figures in the very center are uh, two prostitutes who for him embodied not only glamour and alienation, but the sad reality of a culture in which everything was for sale. You see them surrounded by this uh, relatively faceless, anonymous mass, right, of these black garb suited men, none of whom engage them directly. These are symbolic representations of a form of urban angst that is made all the more dramatic by the way that he tilts and spills this composition out toward us. Um, the effect is claustrophobic, I think, for us as a viewer and is reminiscent of what it must have been like for Kirchner to experience the streets of Berlin in 1913.
This song was written by Ilse Weber in the Theresienstadt ghetto. In 1939, Ilse Weber, she managed to send away her oldest son, Hanusch, from Prague to Sweden. Three years later, she writes, letter to my son in Theresienstadt. Hanusch Weber, he still lives in Sweden. Ilse Weber and her youngest son, Tommy, they died in Auschwitz in 1944. Hanusch Weber and Ilse Weber's grandchild, Tommy, is here with us tonight. Letter to my son. My dear son, three years have passed today. Alone you left for a world so far away. I can see you at the station there in Prague. By the open window, we say goodbye. Your brown and curly head is leaning through. You cry and beg, please let me stay with you. Please let me stay at home with you. To say farewell was hard for you to take. You were so little frail and only eight. And when we had to walk home without you, I felt my heart would break in two. I've cried so much and wish that we were near Still I'm happy that you are not here I'm happy you are not here An unknown woman took you as her son She will go to heaven for what she has done I bless her with every breath I take Be good and love her for my Life here is dismal now and full of fear. They took all that we owned and had so dear. Our house and home, everything is gone. They plundered us, nothing's left alone. They took your train set and without remorse, even your brother's little rocking horse, even your brother's rocking horse. We couldn't keep our names, they stripped us bare And gave us numbers round our necks to wear Marked like cattle, I bear the disgrace If your father could live with me in this place Your brother cannot even stay with me I am as lonely as one ever can be I am as lonely as one can be You're still too little To grasp what it means To carry the pain of Loneliness and tears Body against body In one room Lying together In sorrow and gloom Are you healthy? Are you learning well, my dear? Now no one sings Your lullabies, I fear you there before my eyes and once again I feel you at my side imagine when we meet again one day you will be wondering what I say you have probably forgotten all your German and Swedish is too hard for me to learn wouldn't that be strange it would be fun all at once to have a grown-up son Do you like to play with tin soldiers today? Harriet Barracks is the place where I must stay With cold, dreary rooms and dark, damaged walls No sun, no trees, no leaves at all I work here as a children's nurse Comforting and helping so they don't feel Keep God 
and watch them through the night. The room has just one lamp, a feeble light. I sit in silence and protect their sleep. And every child is you whom I can't keep. So many thoughts and dreams that we were near. Still I'm happy that you are not here. I'm happy you are not here. A thousand torments I could still endure. If a happy childhood is for you and sure. Now I must get some rest, it's getting late. I wish that I could see you for one moment. But dearest son, I can only write to you letters of longing that will not get through.
Selma was part of a gang of friends who were passionate about the world and they were passionate about life. And for them, art and poetry and music and political engagement were all part of the same um, fabric. So before the, before the war, before World War II started, uh, Selma and her friends spent a lot of time worrying about the world. And they, they worried about right-wing populism. They worry, worried about the rise of fascism. They worried about Hitler's influence. And they worried about the influence in Romania. Because as Selma was growing up, uh, beginning in the late, I would say, mid to late 30s, there was an increasing Romanian nationalist movement uh, in Chernovitz, which was the town she came from and which was under Romanian control at that time. Both Anne Frank and Selma were, at, were murdered before their time. Both were, were young people of great talent and great possibility who, because of their innocence when they died, um, are heartbreaking symbols of a world gone crazy, a world gone amok. But Selma and Anne Frank had that, uh, I think, a similar passion for life and a concern about the world, but it was expressed in different ways. Anne Frank wrote a diary, and Selma wrote poetry. Selma's poetry talks about the two great the two great forces that shaped her life. One was, don't forget, she wrote these poems when she was 15 to 17. One was love, and she did have an unrequited love, and that's expressed very clearly in several of the poems. But she was also writing as her world was caving in on her, as um, hatreds were stalking her and her poetry, and that's reflected as well. She wrote this uh, poem called Grief, Haggard, hungry horses standing there, oozing steam with empty eyes, soaked through, scattered on the moistened ground, oats now serve no useful purpose. Drenched from head to toe, a cat creeps along the moldy wall. With his collar raised, a farmer looks at his money. Will it see him through? I'm a specialist in Latin America, and I've written works on the Inca Empire and colonial Peru. And my interests have been around issues of power and how they're expressed in cultural ways. I hope I did justice and tried to think about those questions uh, as I brought them to my study of Selma. Now, the study of Selma, honestly, came out of the blue. Um, as I said, my mother is Selma's closest living relative. Um, we, knew she was a poet, and the family had contributed to a private publication of her poetry. But it really wasn't until my mother was invited to Chernovitz, to Chernipsy, Selma's hometown, when the city government, along with a university professor and Austrian literati and a professor from Germany, put a plaque on her tenement door in her honor. And my sister and I were humbled by that to realize both our own ignorance and to realize the richness of um, our lives that we had missed over the years. And that was part of our interest in translating Selma into English uh, and to be sure that her, to hope that her work would then be available to a wider audience.
Slaaf mijn kind, kent slaaf oudste. 